Welcome to Computer Science for Normal People. This will be one of the most math-heavy lessons we do for the entire course. But don't worry, you won't need to do any of the math. I just want you to understand why your computer thinks the way it does. To do that, we're going to talk about data. Computer science, the golden arena of endless well-paying jobs, needs problem solvers from all backgrounds, but appears surrounded by a thick wall of incomprehensible ones and zeros, self-righteous nerd minions, and endless differential equation nightmares. This video textbook attempts to create an entrance through that wall by teaching programming basics in the language of real people. This video is a lecture covering programming tools and methods. To watch a real-life example in three different coding languages, click here. And to listen to this chapter's lecture on computer science beyond programming, click here. Now we hear the word data a lot nowadays. Mobile data, data privacy. This compelling research was based on new data. It sounds nerdy, doesn't it? With so much technical jargon associated with data, it would be reasonable to expect that the word data would have a very specific definition. But it really doesn't. Data is simply information. It's a very loose term because it needs to be. You might need to tell a computer that your eyes are brown. That's data. You might need to tell the computer the airspeed velocity of an unladen swallow. That's also data. You might need to tell the computer whether that swallow is African or European. That's also data. Data is any kind of information that you need to represent, store, evaluate, or interpret. You can represent data in lots of ways. The alphabet represents data in symbols. Back when we used film cameras, negatives represented data on film. We represent our moods and burritos in the form of emojis. In nerd language, we call storing data state. The most basic building block of a computer is a state machine. It's a small electrical circuit that's either on or off, depending on some kind of input. Now, most engineers wouldn't call this a state machine, but just for an example, if you needed to talk to an airline stewardess while on a flight, you could simply push a button that will send electricity to a light bulb that represents your state to the stewardess, thus sending the data that you need them. In that scenario, there are two states of data. Yes, I need your help, or no, I don't really need to talk to you right now. Let's say they add another button. Let's call this the emergency button. Now you can tell the stewardess four different messages. You can say, I don't need to talk to you, and it's not an emergency. I want to talk to you, but it isn't an emergency. I need to talk to you, and it's an emergency. I have an emergency, and I don't want to talk about it. Maybe that's more of just a hint to everyone to stop forming a line near the laboratory. This way of communicating state is called binary. Yeah, I bet you didn't know you were speaking binary every time you push that button, but you pretty much are. A common misconception is that binary is a computer language, but it's more like an alphabet. English and Italian use the same characters, but they mean different things, just like on or off will mean different things depending on the circuit that you're using it in. In our first example, on meant that you needed an airline stewardess. In another circuit, a man assigned numbers to the meaning of on and off. Watch how slick this is. If this means that a number can be divided by four once, and this represents that the remainder can be divided by two once, and this represents that that remainder can be divided by one once, the number six can be represented like this. Six can be divided by four once, leaving a remainder of two. Two can be divided by two once, leaving a remainder of zero. Zero can't be divided by one, so let's just leave that spot blank. Look at that. That is one possible way of saying six in binary. Now let's try number one. One can't be divided by four or two, but it can be divided by one. There we go. Now this might sound a little weird, but hear me out. What if we were to add a circuit that takes two inputs and outputs on or off depending on what those inputs are? For example, if I turn on both of these, it turns this one off. If I turn on just one, it keeps this one on. Now watch what happens to our number. One plus two plus four is seven, in the same way that one plus six is seven. Through a few electrical engineering tricks, we can do all sorts of mathematic operations on binary numbers. At this point, and maybe not even ever, you don't need to understand how your computer processes binary in its circuits, but you do need to understand that every time you give a computer input, it's storing that somewhere as an on or an off. You also need to understand the limitations of binary. For example, what if I tried to add the number two to a six on this circuit? Well, that isn't true. That number is just garbage math. Nerds call this overflow. So this circuit can only represent numbers up to seven. Anything above that will overflow. But did you notice in our airplane example that just by adding a second light, you got two more options? The number of states that you can represent grows exponentially with the number of ons or offs that you have. Now we call an on or an off a bit because you can only store a little bit of information inside. No dad jokes. <laughs> All right. Now someone got the bright idea that if we had enough bits, 
we could represent the whole alphabet and punctuation. Just like Morse code, all we'd have to do was agree on what each pattern of ones and zeros meant. During the first draft of that code, they found that they needed eight bits to represent all the characters they planned to use. So how many groups of eight bits your computer held was how many characters your computer could remember. And to make it easy, they started to call each group of eight bits a byte. 8,000 bits, or in other words, 1,000 bytes, could store 1,000 characters. Eventually, they started to measure computer storage in how many thousands of characters you could store it, or in other words, kilobytes. Soon, computers got efficient enough to store megabytes, a thousand kilobytes, then gigabytes, a thousand megabytes, and so it continues. Now, there is one more thing we should talk about before we get programming, and that's the difference between memory and storage. In your computer, there's two ways to store state or data. One is very fast, but requires a constant stream of power. The other is slower, but state can remain after the plug has been pulled. Nerds call this persistent data. Your storage, like your hard drive or your SD card, is slow, but can keep state indefinitely. Your RAM, short for random access memory, and we'll talk more about why it's called that later, or memory, as we more commonly refer to it nowadays, stores things for instant use. When you run a program, the code is copied from your storage to your memory so that your computer can run it quickly. Then after you finish manipulating it, it gets sent back to storage. Now it is a little more complicated than that, but for our purposes, this works well. This is why if you don't have something saved and the power goes out, your computer won't remember where you were. It also means that to write efficient code, you have to constantly be thinking about how you're budgeting the memory that you're storing things in. You'll get used to thinking about memory. As a programmer, it becomes important in just about everything you do. I think that's our lesson for this week. In the exercise, we'll be setting up our computers to write code, and next week we'll actually start writing code.